So if you guys are watching this video in March or whenever I just posted this video, most of you are probably confused about why crypto is going up right now. Like you're, it was only last week, the entire world was collapsing, all these banks were dying, and now Bitcoin is up 40% in a week. It's one of the largest rallies that Bitcoin has ever done on the back of the whole fucking banking system almost collapsing. And you're probably sitting there like, what the hell is happening? Why is Bitcoin pumping? Why is the whole crypto market pumping? Why hasn't it collapsed? And <laughs> that's why I made this video because I'm going to be going over the crypto game, the game of crypto explained so that you can understand why exactly the market went up when it, you didn't expect it to. Because I actually predicted this whole thing. I expected the market to go up. If you look at this tweet that I put out on the 10th of March, which was literally at the exact bottom here. I said, look at the four photos below and tell me the bottom isn't near for crypto. And I used a few different tools here, but we're not going to be covering these tools today. We're going to be com covering something a bit different. But as you can see here, the price was at $19,800. That was basically uh, the exact bottom here before we went up. This whole move made sense to me. And if it didn't make sense to you, I'm going to make it make sense to you because there's eight key components that I'm going to be explaining in this video that if you understand them in enough, in enough depth that I'm going to cover in this video, it's going to give you a killer instinct for predicting tops and bottoms and understanding the market like the back of your hand. That's what you're going to feel like after this video if you listen carefully. And so but without you know any further ado, let's get started. Number one, the number one key concept is crypto as a video game. So I've made this little demonstration of a crypto video game to help you understand how the market works. So imagine for a second, a hundred people in a room and every single person has blindfolds. Imagine in your mind, in your little mind, like a little house and there's two sides in this room, okay, in the house. And it's a big room because you've got a hundred people in it. And so you have a choice when you have the blindfolds on with these hundred other people is you have a choice. Do you go on the left side or do you go on the right side? And you have to continually make a decision. Are you going to swap sides? Are you going to stay on the same side? What are you going to do? Now, there's never going to be more than 100 people in this room, in this example. And if you decide to change sides and there is less than 50 people on the other side, you will gain points. Now, if you decide to change sides and there's more than 50 people, you will lose points. And now the aim of the game is to consistently move to the uncrowded side, the side with less than 50 people. You want to keep doing that before everyone else does so that you can keep accumulating points. Now, this metaphor is exactly like how crypto works, because in crypto, in stocks, in every asset class, if you copy what most people do, you will lose money because if everyone has bought something if everyone has bought Bitcoin and there's no one left to buy, how would the price continue to go higher? If everyone in this video game has gone over to the right side, let's say 99 people are here and one, are, one is here and you're on the, on the right side, how can you accumulate more points? How, how can you win the game if there's no one left to come across? How could you make money if you owned Bitcoin and everyone had already bought. So that's the sort of metaphor I'm trying to draw on here. It's that in this video game, you make, you make points, you make money if you are constantly doing the opposite of the herd, if you're moving to the places where people aren't at. That is how you make money in crypto. You need to do the opposite of what people are doing. So what were, what were people doing at the bottom here? Well, everyone was shitting themselves. Oh my God, the panic on Twitter was ridiculous. Everyone was like, oh my God, Silvergate Bank is exploding. All these other banks are going to explode. The market's going to crash like it did with Luna. <sighs> A bunch of people who have no fucking clue what is happening. Look at this chart and look at the funding data. The funding data showed us that the market was really bearish. Look at how red it is compared to the other points. And when the market is really bearish, it means that everyone has already sold. And if everyone has already sold, there's no one left to sell. So everyone was afraid. They all sold, capitulated when Silvergate fucking died. And that's when I knew the bottom is basically in. And that's when I began to buy. And now look, the price is up 40%. Why? 
because everyone had sold. And what is left to do after every what is left to do after everyone has sold? Buy. That's all you can do. So all you can do is buy. Okay? That is that is how that is how this works and that is why this video game metaphor is important. Now, as I said, imagine in this game that the left side is a crypto being a crypto holder and imagine on this side is being a fiat holder. So imagine you want to buy crypto to buy Bitcoin in this game, you got to go to the left side. And to sell, sell the Bitcoin, you got to go to the right side. So, if you are on the fiat side, the right side, and you move to the crypto side, so you buy crypto, but there's 90 people on this side and there's 10 people on this side, you're making a bad decision because there's only 10 minus 1, so 9 people left who can go and buy crypto. There's not many people left. Okay, because it's a closed loop, remember? And this ties into our next lesson. Markets are closed loops, okay? They are zero-sum games. That when the Federal Reserve runs out of money, they don't go steal someone else's, they go and print their own money from thin air. But when you make money, you are not the Federal Reserve. You take people's money. You never make money, you take it, okay? So, in a zero-sum game... If you make a profit in crypto, you're stealing someone's money. You stole that grandma's hard-earned cash that she's been working her whole life to save up. You stole it from her fucking wallet, her little purse. And if you lose money in crypto, someone came along, went in your wallet, and they took a hundred bucks out. They took a thousand bucks out, whatever it is. They stole your money. That is how crypto works, okay? Everyone's profit is someone else's loss. It's player versus player. It's like a video game. It's like this one. It's player versus player. If you win a point, you took the point from someone else. You can only make points if you do what the other people aren't doing. Okay? It's the exact same. Crypto is zero sum and it's just like surviving in the wild. If you want to eat dinner tonight and you're a fucking lion, you got to go hunt something. You got to go kill some shit. Okay? You got to go get your wife's if you're a lion to go hunt for you because the lion doesn't hunt. Okay? But anyway. Now, let's get on to the next one. Reflexivity. This is the next important concept to understand in crypto. What is reflexivity? What is this weird big word that you're using that you're trying to confuse us with, Daniel? Well, reflexivity is large swings in either direction. So, Bitcoin is known for being reflexive and all of crypto is known for being reflexive because of how volatile it is. Okay? So, you can view Bitcoin and crypto as if it's Newton's cradle. What is Newton's cradle? Well, I've attached a photo for your convenience. Have a look at these five balls. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. What you do is, is you pick up one ball, you pull it back, and then you let go, and the ball goes down. It hits the line of balls. The other one bounces off, and it just bounces back and forth like this until it stops. This is just like crypto, and let me show you a chart to give you an example. This is the Verge chart. So as you can see, at this big pump here, it was the equivalent of pulling the ball back. And then you hit the other balls, boom, it pump. And what happens when it pumps and it runs out of buyers? It comes straight back just as hard. Boom, crash. And then it, once it crashes, it doesn't go down forever. And then it comes back and it goes up again. So as you can see, pump, crash, pump, crash, and then lots of little pumps. Okay, and it happens again. Pump, crash, pump, crash. <laughs> and that is why crypto is reflexive and it's just like Newton's cradle. So, how do you action this? Well, markets are going to go up more than you expect and markets are also going to go down more than you expect because they're reflexive. So, do not be surprised if Bitcoin goes up 40% in a day. Oh, sorry, not in a day, in a week because that is totally normal and that has been done many times before in Bitcoin's history, Okay. Key component number four. Oh, no, we're still talking about new, new network effect here. So, yeah, just like Newton's cradle, the harder you pull it back, the further the ball is going to bounce on the other side. The harder the coin pumps, the more it's going to dump. The further the parabolic rally, the harsher the pullback, okay? Now, what causes the reflexivity? It's all about the network effect. I'm sure you've heard about network effect from Facebook, you know, Facebook's more valuable the more people use it. Instagram. Network effect applies for crypto as well, okay? And the valuation of cryptocurrencies is very largely tied to its network effect. 
What is network effect? Well, it is the value of something, and it's the increasing value of something as more people use it. So, in a network effect, if 100 people use Facebook, it's useless because it's only fucking 100 people. Who wants to look at 100 people's... You wouldn't even know who the 100 people are who use it. If a billion people use Facebook, oh, wow, that's valuable because everyone's using it now. You, your grandma's on there, fucking your second cousin's on there. Whoa. Okay, so it's network effect. It's all about the value of something changing. The more people that use crypto, the more valuable it becomes. Now, this dynamic of more users equals more value is actually a feedback loop. And let me explain why this feedback loop exists. So, if the price of a crypto rises and that causes people to make a profit and the people who make a profit tell their friends and those friends buy the coin and that coin and because there's more people that have the coin it's more adoption and because there's more adoption there's a, a greater network effect and because there's a greater network effect the value of the underlying thing is higher and because the value is higher the price goes up and because the price goes up more people buy See how there's a feedback loop here. It sort of like helps itself. It's like a Ponzi, right? The more people that do it, the more people hear about it, the, better, the, more, the more the value is, the more the price goes up. It's like a, it's a fucking feedback loop, okay? So, n- feedback loops create reflexive and parabolic price rises because the growth occurs in a parabolic fashion. The more people that use something, the faster it spreads, right? Who, what will grow a crypto faster if 100 people tell their friends they made a profit or a million? It's going to be a million. Imagine a million people making 10 grand and then they tell all their dickhead friends who didn't get into crypto because they're fucking lazy and now they start buying at the top because, oh my God, J- Joseph, he's a, he made all this money. It's my turn. I'm going to get rich. That is what causes the network effect and the feedback loop, okay? Because people make money. They tell their friends. The price goes up, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, negative feedback loops exist as well. I'm not going to read all this. Fuck that. You don't want to read all this, do you? Too much writing. So, negative feedback loops exist as well. A negative feedback loop is the exact opposite of a positive feedback loop. So, a negative feedback loop is like the price falls, people sell, less users of the platform, less users means it's worth less. If it's worth less, the price drops. If the price drops, more people exit and sell. And it's, you know, a really bad negative feedback loop. And again, this ties back into this photo. This is a feedback loop. People buy. See, look, the first test pump. This got everyone excited. Test pump. Everyone excited. Test pump. Ran out of buyers. Feedback, negative feedback loop kicks in. Just like here. Pump, 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 pump. Eventually, the top's in. Same sort of thing, okay? And so, that's negative, that's network effects. Number four is funding data. Now, imagine for a second, you had the ability to know exactly when a group of consistently unprofitable traders are buying and selling at any time, allowing you to counter trade them and make money. This is what funding data allows you to do because funding data shows you what the average market participant thinks is going to happen. And remember what we said about the herd? Remember what we said up here? Or have you already forgotten? Remember what we said here? You want to do what the uncrowded thing is, what the less, the least popular thing is. You don't want to follow the herd. You don't want to move to the side with 90 people, okay? So, with this funding tool it basically tells you hey daniel so just letting you know that uh you know most of the market is short afraid little pussies and they think price is gonna fall that's what funding was showing me right here funding is like my little friend it was like hey dan just letting you know that um yeah everyone's a pussy and they all sold crypto and they're all shorting the bottom just letting you know um just a little alpha for you i recommend buying because everyone's scared and i was just like oh Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Bought the bottom 40% in a week. That's what I did here. That's what we're talking about in this tweet. This tweet was alpha given to me by my friend called Funding Data. No one really wants to listen to my friend Funding Data because, I don't know, they don't fucking listen. But anyways, that's how Funding Data works, okay? It's like a little insider 
knowledge into what the average person is doing because you want to do the opposite of the average person, okay? So, the, the funding data is a number, right? It's a data set. Boring, I know. But it's a number between 100 and minus 100%. So, this is what it looks like. I know it looks like a pile of shit, but anyway. Look, uh, you can see it's green and it's red. The higher the number, so the higher the, the green thing, the more bullish the average trader is. So, remember we want to do the opposite. The higher the number, the more you want to start to sell. The less you actually want to be holding a project. And yeah, the lower it goes, the more bearish. So, if it's minus 50%, like here, minus 50%, that means the, the funding is negative. So, it's negative funding. And it shows us that most traders are betting on price going down. Now, why is this data useful? Funding data is basically the only data set in existence that doesn't suffer from alpha decay. Alpha decay is one of the most frustrating parts of using data in crypto. Because you'll find this data set, which is so amazing. You'll go, fuck yeah, I can just use this to buy bottoms. But the thing is, everyone finds out about the tools that work. And when everyone finds out about a tool that works, it doesn't work. Because you only make money if someone else loses money. And if everyone's using the same tools, trying to take the same people's money, it won't work. Because you can only take money from people who don't have the information that you do. Who are willing to give you... like. You can only take money if you do the opposite of someone else. If you sell, if you buy and you sell, if you buy at a dollar and you sell it at two, someone lost money because they bought it off you at two dollars when you bought it at one. Now, if your data set, your if your alpha is the same as everyone else's alpha, you can't do that because you're all copying each other. It won't work. So yeah, alpha decay is when too many people use a source of alpha and it decays. Okay, it's not like. Uh, don't worry, I won't even mention that. It's just alpha decaying because too many people are using it, okay? And because funding doesn't suffer from alpha decay, I've been using this data set for literally over three years. I've been using it for. And I've been using it in the sense of an algorithm for how long now? August, September 2021. Almost two years now I've been using this um, this algorithm here. So, you're looking at this algo. I invented this. It's called the Hunter Algos. Most of you probably are already seen it. So, I've been using this tool with very minimal changes to buy bottoms and sell tops for over two years now. So, sorry, for almost two years now. The re Now, name another data set in crypto that has lasted this long without needing to be changed. Doesn't really exist. Maybe there's a couple, but it doesn't really exist. So, that's the beauty of funding, okay? There's a couple other reasons why funding's cool too. It gives a huge edge into knowing when to counter trade the herd. As well, the sentiment of traders is the same sentiment of the rest of the market. So, funding data tells you what the average trader is thinking. Trader is in someone using leverage on Binance, BitMEX, Bybit, whatever it is. Okay? But the thing is about humans, if Joe on Binance is 10x long because he's really bullish, his brain sentiment, his brain emotion is the same brain emotion that fucking Stephanie, the, the Bitcoin buyer who doesn't use leverage, who used Coinbase. It's the same emotion that she is feeling. It's an interpersonal set of emotions that every human feels which this funding data is tracking. So yeah, someone might say, yeah, but the 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 traders that they um that their sentiment's different from most people. No, it's not. No, it's not. The traders on these leverage exchanges have the same emotions as the people who are buying Bitcoin without leverage on a normal exchange like me. Okay? Just because they're dumb and they use leverage doesn't mean they're any dumber, any, any dumber than- Just because you don't use leverage doesn't mean you're smarter than someone who uses leverage. You still have the same emotions. So, that's why you can use funding for the whole market. Because this right here, this is not just saying to you, oh, it's, it's a lot of, you know, traders bearish. It's the entire fucking world is afraid. The entire universe is scared. They're all frightened. That's what it's telling you. It's not just traders are scared, it's the whole world, okay? The more extreme the funding data is, 
the more strong the emotions felt. Now, why is this? Well, the measurement of funding data is a bit complex and I don't want to get all nerdy on you, but I'll get us a little bit nerdy on you just because I know you, you want a little bit of nerdiness, okay? You want to understand what the fuck this magical tool is. So, the more extreme the funding data is, the more strong the emotions felt because funding data tells you what someone is paying for the privilege to be long or short. So, a trader on BitMEX or Binance, whatever the leverage exchange is, they have to pay money if they are doing a long or a short trade that most of the market is doing. So, if 9 out of 10 traders on Binance are trying to long because they're really bullish, they have to pay funding for the privilege to copy everyone else. If you're going to be the dickhead who longs when everyone else is longing and you're going to try to cause issues with our exchange by making it less liquid, we're going to punish you for being an idiot. That's what, the, that's what the funding data is basically doing. And so, the more negative or the more positive the funding, the more fees a trader is paying for the privilege to be long or short, okay? And I'm not going to explain if negative funding is who gets paid for that or who pays. I'm not going to explain, but that's basically what it is, okay? So, see the really red part? Everyone was shitting themselves. They were paying 0.05% every eight hours for the privilege to short the market. The privilege to lose money. That'd be like, that'd be like going on the street up to someone random and saying, I'm going to charge you 50 bucks to take a thousand dollars from you. And that person going, that's okay. You can, you can take my thousand dollars and yeah, here's 50 bucks. Thank you for taking my money. That's a thank you message. That's what just happened to the idiots who shorted the bottom. Now, the problem, what am I saying here? Yeah, so Silvergate, Silvergate Bank had just collapsed and people were fearing a total contagion and stock market crash that would bring crypto down with it. But the problem was funding was negative, meaning everyone had already sold, meaning that Bitcoin had no power in the tank left um, to basically sell. Okay, and so this chart shows you what the uh, this chart is. This chart relates back to the point I was making up here, where the sentiment of traders is the same sentiment of the rest of the market. So basically, the traders were shitting themselves as seen through the funding data, and the rest of the market was too. And they both, what do they both have in common? Well, they both sold the bottom. <laughs> they both were afraid at the bottom. That's what they were doing wrong. And so, number five, I forgot to add into this PowerPoint thing. So, I'm going to do it from here, from my Notion document. Number five is supply and demand. So, when Bitcoin rises, the power of Bitcoin holders increases and the power of the fiat holders decreases. Why is this? Well, if Bitcoin goes from $10,000 to $20,000... Bitcoin holders have twice the amount of money that they can use to control the market, right? If you put a thousand bucks in Bitcoin and it doubles, you've now got $2,000. You've got twice the power. So, if you view the supply and demand of the market as two tanks competing with each other to try to control the direction of the market, then you get what happens with the Bitcoin price. So, when Bitcoin rises, the tank of the Bitcoin holders increases because they're all making money, right? They've all got more power. But when the price falls, the Bitcoin, it's the inverse. When the price goes down, Bitcoin holders are losing the value of their coins and the fiat holders, their, their power is increasing because the same fiat can now buy more Bitcoin so they can control the price easier. And so, when you're looking at price in different trends like this, let's say two months of price going up, two months of price going down, you need to visualize in your mind the tank and the amount of water that there is left in the tank. So, when the price is rising like this, sorry, let's do, let's do the falling example. When the price is falling like this, you need to combine all of the different data sets that we just talked about and imagine in your mind how full is each tank? 
So when price is falling here and we got down here, let's say, let's imagine it's the 10th of March. Let's imagine, you, let's imagine for a second you're all shitting yourselves again. Put yourself back in last week's shoes where you were crying because price was falling. Okay. How could you have used this to make money? Well, you would have looked at the funding. It was really bearish. You would have looked at the sentiment, really bearish. And you would have said to yourself, well, everyone's afraid. Everyone has sold. If everyone's sold, that means that the juice of the Bitcoin holders is very low because they've all sold. They've all used their power move. They've ran out of power. They've all sold. How do I know they've all sold? Well, everyone who is scared, like everyone who was scared sold because it was really fearful here. And you can see everyone was afraid that the funding was really negative. So there's no one really left to sell if everyone sold, right? So the tank here was empty. Well, what about the fiat tank? Was the fiat tank full? Okay, well, I mean, funding was really negative and we have a lot of shorts. So that's a lot of future buyers that would, that would get liquidated if the price goes up. Also, gold's rallying. Also, if the banks are failing, that's actually bullish for crypto because... It means that people were going to look for an alternative that, that won't, you know, have the same leverage issues. So, it's actually a bullish narrative for crypto. Okay, so that means that the fiat buyers are actually going to be in control. So, there's actually a really strong imbalance here between the power of the Bitcoin holders and the power of the, the fiat holders. I think the, the power is going to change. That's what you could have said to yourself and you would have been able to buy the bottom. Also, here is a visualization of the tanks in action. So, as I said before, when price falls, the fiat tank gets more powerful because in order for, for them to raise price, they don't need as much fiat because the coin is worth less. So, what is this showing this green thing? The lower the green spike, the more fiat currency is trying to buy crypto, the more bids there are. So, as you can see, as the price falls, the tank, the fiat tank... The power of the fiat tank is increasing because you can see the amount of people trying to buy is increasing. The power of the fiat tank is increasing. And you can see this, this concept I talk about in action. So whenever you're trying to predict the bottom, this is another tool that you can use. You need to look for where are the fiat buyers stepping in? Where are they gaining power? Where is the, the tank getting full? And then that's when you'll know, how, you know when to start buying. And this is what happens in crypto, right? You have, tr you have trends. You have a trend where the, the fiat people are winning. You have trends where the, the Bitcoin people are winning by, you know, too many sellers. And it goes back and forth continually. And it happens here. This is the Bitcoin chart. Buyers are winning. Sellers are winning. Buyers are winning. Sellers are winning. And it happens in trends, right? And yeah, this is what we just talked about. How do you know the tank is empty? It links back to funding data. You knew the tank was empty because they had all sold. The tank was emptied. Okay. Let's get back to here. Number six. Market cycles. Every single market in the history of human time has had the exact same emotional cycles that have occurred regardless of what was happening in the context of the world at that time. Because why is this? Because humans a thousand years ago have the same mental programming the same human nature, the same emotions that, they, that we have now. We haven't changed. We're still the same fucking monkeys, okay? Deep down, we're still fucking monkeys, okay? So, if you can understand market cycles, if you can pick where we are at any given time on this chart, you will be able to buy and sell the bottom. Sorry, you'll be able to buy the bottom and sell the top. Number seven, euth euthanasia roller coaster. So... This is a concept in crypto that you'll, you'll know very well. How many times has the price pretended to go up and you've got bullish thinking that it's going to go up and it never did? And it did this over and over again where it would trick you. It would go up, you'd think the bull market's about to begin and then it didn't begin. It actually just tricked you and it just kept doing this over and over. And then you eventually become conditioned to believe that you're never actually going to get a bull market again. It's just going to constantly go up and go back down. But then one day, when you least expect it, when you're not ready for it, 
the bull market begins and it makes all this money and then you buy the top. But once you've bought the top, the bull market is over. And then as the price is crashing, you get all these little pumps where you think the bull market will continue. But again, you become conditioned. You become used to the fact that prices aren't actually going to keep going up. They just go up slightly. And then again, the bull market begins again. This is what this euthanasia roller coaster is showing. Each time this roller coaster goes around, it resets. And you think, oh my God, the bull market's never going to happen. And so you're never ready for when it does happen. Right here it happens. And then you buy around here, buying the top. And then whoop, back down again, you lose your money. The idea of the euthanasia roller coaster is to condition you for a market that won't be happening in the future and to take all of your money and kill you. The roller coaster is designed to kill you and to condition you for what won't happen in the future. That is how markets work. Now, number eight, the last one is inflation and money printing. So, markets have trended up over time for centuries. That's just what stocks do and what everything does, okay? Everything just, let's look at the monthly, everything just trends up over time. Why is this? Well, if you look at the money supply of the US dollar, you can see that the money supply is also increasing, right? This is not a great chart, but you can see that this is the total amount of money in existence. How much money is there? Sorry, not total amount of money, but this is the total amount of M2. 21 trillion. This is the total M2 of the US dollar. This is just continually going up. Why do stocks go up? Well, there's more money to buy stocks. If there's more money to buy stocks, that means the price will go up. Okay? So why does crypto go up? What makes what makes what makes these Bitcoin bubbles that we keep having? Well, it's all about the the deviation in the trend of global M2. So what does that mean? M2 is growing like this all the time. Sometimes it grows faster, sometimes it grows slower, but it's generally always growing. And so if the M2 is growing and it trends faster than normal, this leads to more print, this is more money in existence, and that's more buying power for financial markets. And so if you have more buying power, people tend to go out into the risk spectrum more because they have more money to play with. So, as you can see here, the more, the, the, the faster the growth in M2, the bigger the rally in, in the crypto market. So, the total crypto market year-on-year -year growth percent is 100% in line with an with a with a increasing rate of growth in M2. I know it's a little bit complex, but basically, more money that's printed, bigger bull market. And also, the bear markets tend to begin when printing slows down. Okay, it doesn't have to mean printing stops, but even if printing slows down, even if the, the growth in M2 is slowing, it, that is enough to cause crypto, the negative feedback loop to kick into play. Remember, we talked about negative feedback loops. And now that is the end of this video. I'm going to show you on the screen right now um, the mastermind directory. Now, this entire document. Now, thank you all for watching this video. I'm going to be popping up on your screen right now, the mastermind directory. Everything we talked about here is one of the topics that we cover inside of the directory. My mastermind is an exclusive application only community of crypto investors looking to get to seven figures from the end of the next bull run. If you are wanting to be one of the five people I select every month to work one on one alongside me to get to seven figures, You'll find an application form at danscryptomastermind.com. The link to the website is in my bio of this video. Um, I'd love to see you apply. I'll be getting back to anyone who does in a few days. But thank you for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.